Hi, I'm Dr. J, and this is a video about how to get started using R. We're going to try to ease into the process because I know learning a new language, new, learning a new piece of statistical software can be intimidating. And so the goal of this video is to just kind of get you over the hump of that apprehension of, of getting into the software. And the way that we're going to do it is we're just going to use R as a calculator just like you would on your phone or you would in a calculator app on the computer, perhaps use Excel for your uh, calculator needs, right? So we're going to just start by using R as a calculator and so that we can try to ease you into the process of dealing with this new piece of software or statistical uh, computing environment. All right, so uh, hopefully you've already installed R. If you haven't installed R, there'll be a link in the description below to my video about how to install R, and in particular, the R Studio graphical user interface that I will be using throughout this video series. When you start up R Studio, you'll get a uh, desktop environment that looks like this. Uh, and the first thing I want you to do is to just start typing in some calculator operations in this window on the left side that's called the console. You can see the tab up on the upper left here. And so go ahead and just type in right some um, some calculator operations, just like you would on a calculator, and just see what happens. And the first thing I want to point out is that the uh, output here is going to be prefaced by this square bracket one square bracket. There'll be more on what this is in a future video, but for now, I want you just to think about that as here's the output. Okay. So go ahead and type in some normal calculator operations that you might think of. Uh, and you know, as you do this, you might uh, have some errors. And so you might do something like, I don't know, this. Okay, and so you get a plus sign here. If you ever get that plus sign and you're not really sure what's going on, the key thing you can do is just hit escape to get out of there. And that brings you back to the console prompt. That greater than symbol there is the prompt in the console. Uh, you might have a different type of typo here, uh, something like this, right, where you can see an error. So fine, so you got an error. No big deal, you just try again. Now, when you're typing into the console, a really convenient trick is to use the up and down arrows. So if you use the up arrow right now, it'll bring you back to the last command that you entered. Uh, and if you keep hitting the up arrow, it'll bring you back to the previous command that you used. Now, if you start going down, it'll bring you back to the most recent commands. Okay, and so in this case, what I wanted to do here is that instead of using uh, the ampersand, I really meant to write in an eight. So let's go ahead and write in an eight. And now we get, uh, this is three raised to the eighth power. It was actually only in the recording of this video that I realized that you could use the asterisk asterisk to be an exponent. But typically in my code, I will go ahead and use the uh, caret symbol for the exponent. Okay, so now while it's great to be typing into the console, I'm going to highly encourage you to not be typing to the console and instead be using a script. Now, in order to run a script in R, you want to go ahead and click on this new file link up here in R Studio. If you're in the just base R graphical user interface, then you probably have to go up to file a new script or something like that. So here we're just going to open up a new script and what you'll see in our desktop environment here in our studio is that a new uh, pane opens up, right? So we've got this console pane on the left that we've been paying attention to. Uh, I think I'm probably going to cover up what's going on in the upper right hand with my picture. Uh, and then we've got this pane in the bottom right hand that we'll talk about in another video. But right now you'll see a fourth pane opened up and it typically by default will open up right above the console window. And so you can see here, there's a new script. Right now it's called Untitled1 because I haven't saved it and given it a name. Uh, if you open up more scripts, then they will just pop open as new tabs up in this upper window, okay? For now, we only need the one. And so what's really nice up here is that uh, you can do the same calculator operations you were doing before. So you can do two times three, I don't know, 435, that's not 435, 345 uh, minus 32. And now you'll notice that nothing has happened down in the t console window below when I've typed everything up here into the script. And so R is still waiting for you to enter those commands into the console. And now the really convenient way to do this is to run uh, a line or a collection of lines at a time using command R, sorry, command enter if you're on a Mac or control enter if you are on a PC. So here we have command enter. And now you can see that 
my cursor, which was up here on line one, has moved down to line two, and also in the console window below, you can see that it executed that first line, two times three, and it showed you the output is six. So um, when you do that, command enter, right? It'll run that line and it'll move the cursor down to the next line and you can go ahead and then run the next line. You can also, if you want to, run a whole collection of code all at once just by highlighting all of that code like this. That will go ahead and run. Maybe I'll make sure it's clear. It'll go ahead and run that whole collection of code at once. Um, and in this case, it was just those two lines. Okay, so this is really how I would recommend that you work with R, is to write commands into the script. Um, there are some commands that I enter directly into the console, but primarily I'm writing in a script and running directly out of that script. If you don't like keyboard commands, there are other ways to run these lines. So you can click over here on run. That would run that line. It still moves the cursor down. If you highlight the bunch, it will run that whole bunch by clicking on that run button. Okay, so now uh, a great way to learn statistical software is actually just to get somebody else's script. So that's what we're gonna do next. All right, if you wanna run somebody else's script, well, you first have to have the script, uh, you can actually grab the script for this video down in the description below, right? And if you grab that uh, file, uh, it should look something like this, unless I've made modifications in the meantime. Um, but now here you have my script, I will comment at this point about comments in the script. Uh, you can see that these hashtags uh, in my coloring here in our studio, uh, it's put them in purple and these are comments. So anytime you see a uh, hash symbol or the number sign, uh, that means it's a comment and nothing will actually happen if you run that line. Okay, so here we go. Um, if we just want to start running the script, you should probably actually always start in line one in a script, and then you can just hit command enter a bunch of times. So command enter. Uh, you'll notice it went through the command, the comment, and immediately went to the next line and the line and ran it anyway. So we ran the line one plus two. Now one minus two, one divided by two, one times two, one to the second power. And now you can see there's blank space there on line seven and eight. Uh, blank space in R it doesn't mean anything, so you don't have to worry about uh, white space. Um, but now it just jumped down to the next line. If you continue to run, you can see that now there's additional lines that you can run uh, in R. Um, and it, these lines are all meant to demonstrate some of the standard calculator operations that R does. So the first thing is that it, R does standard order of operations. So if you run this line, you'll see it does 1 plus 3 first. Right, then it does the 100 to the second power, uh, then multiplies that one plus three times two, and finally adds the two together for a final result of 10,008. Uh, running the next line, um, here we have the sine of two pi. Um, if you think real quick uh, about what the sine of two pi should be, first off, you'll notice that we're working in radians here. Um, but sine of two pi should be the same as the sine of zero, which should in fact be zero. You notice that the output down at R, uh, I just moved this over, the output down at R does not look like zero. Um, this right here is a scientific notation as uh, expressed by R. So what this is, this is the number negative 2.449294. This e to the negative 16 means times 10 raised to the negative 16th power. And so I put a little comment here up in the script just to denote what this number is equal to. So it's equal to this piece right here. So that little E digit down in the output represents times 10 raised to the power that comes after it. And now going back to the fact that sine of two pi should be zero, this is in fact numerically zero. Okay, so times 10 to the negative 16th is a very small number and it's effectively zero. Uh, R has a whole bunch of different uh, standard functions, just like a calculator would have, or you know, perhaps a scientific calculator would have. So we have the square root function. We've already talked about exponentials. Um, I will note that if you try to use the log function, right? If you say to yourself, what should the log of 10 be, right? You might say that it should be one, um, but in fact here it's going to be 2.3. And the reason is that the default base in R is base E. Okay, that Euler's number E. Uh, if you wanted to change bases, there's a couple of ways to do it, but the most general one is to have a new argument here where you tell R what base it should be using. So here in this case, 
I'm using base 10. All right, now, while it's great to be using R as a calculator, right, you're not really gaining too much advantage over using a calculator app uh, or using Excel or something of that nature, uh, where R really starts to perform much better, and I highly encourage you to do this, is when you start using variable names. So in this case, I'm going to name the variable A, and I'm going to assign it the value of 1. So right now I ran this line, it says A is one. You'll notice that there's no output, right? All it says is just it has a new prompt ready for a next, uh, some next operation to be entered. So here we go, B is two. And the real value here now is that you can very quickly do a bunch of calculations with those values A and B. So just like we did above, right? A plus B, A minus B, A divided by B, A times B and A raised to the B power, for instance. And now it's really convenient if you go back and you say, okay, well, I wanted A not to be one, but I want it to be four. So now you just change A to four and you can rerun the whole series of commands. Now, I wanna talk very briefly about uh, assignment in R. There's actually three different ways, at least that I know of, that you can assign things in R. Uh, you saw the first one where you just use the equal sign. Um, this is not as common in R as the very first one here in line 29 where basically you construct an arrow. And here you construct the arrow by using a less than sign and a minus or subtraction symbol. And so this is typically used more commonly in R programming. Uh, one thing is you can tell an R program pretty quickly by looking at what it's using for assignment. Uh, if it's using this uh, arrow uh, the notation, then it's an R language. Somebody in the comments can tell me if there's any other languages that use this kind of arrow assignment operation. So here, this is going to assign the value 1 into the object A, or variable A. But now it turns out that in R, you can actually do the assignment the other way. Uh, and generally, we don't use this, right? So this is going to be assigning the value 2 into the variable B. Um, and it's a little bit awkward to use that. It's much more common to use the first one. But I, in fact, find this to be helpful every once in a while when I've entered some kind of long command into the console, uh, and then I decide I want to save that. I will then just quickly up arrow to get back to the thing, uh, and then at the end, sorry, up arrow on the keyboard, not to be confused with the arrows here, uh, and then after I've up arrow to the command that I want to save, I will just use the right arrow and save it into something. And so I use this on occasion, but not very frequently. Huh. And if you want to see the values of these objects, you can go ahead and just type the name. And this is probably something I would actually do just in the console as opposed to up in the script. I would say, okay, what's A? Well, A is 1, B is 2, and C is never assigned. All right, so apparently I never ran this line 31. This is a good reminder, everybody. If you're working with a script, you should run every line in that script. Don't skip. Okay, so here we go. C is now 3, and I can check by typing C. Okay, we'll get back to what that C function deal is uh, in a future video. If you're using variable names, it's much better to use informative variable names, right? Generally, try not to use A, B, and C because as you're reading your code, it's gonna be very confusing as to what's what. And so I have a couple examples where we try to use more informative uh, variable names. So here I have a length and a width. The idea here is that I'm going to be calculating the area and the circumference of a rectangle. As a reminder, right, the area is just uh, the length times the width, and the circumference is the area all the way around, so it's the length plus the width plus the length plus the width, otherwise known as 2 times the length plus the width. And so in R, we can go ahead and run those commands. So here we're going to assign length the value 4, width the value 3, and we're going to calculate the area. Uh, and this time we're going to save it into a variable called area. And now if we want to see what that area actually is, we can just type in area or run the line and see that area here is 12. Now we've already defined length and width, so we can just use them right away to calculate the circumference. And the circumference turns out to be 14. Another example here uh, is a circle, right? So we have a circle. It really only has sort of one value that's of interest. That's the radius or diameter. Uh, and with that radius, we can calculate the area, we can calculate the circumference. Um, I will comment that these will overwrite the previous values that we had, right? So we assigned area up here, but now we've reassigned area down here, and R will just keep the most recent assignment. So here we have area and circumference of that circle with a radius of 2. 
I probably should have picked a different number. Let's go with three and quickly change the example so we have a different value for area and circumference. Um, here's another example where we might do the right triangle. We're trying to figure out the hypotenuse and uh, adjacent lengths of that right triangle uh, using degrees. Here the degrees are given in, I guess, the angle, which is given in degrees. Uh, and we need radians in order to work in R. So here we have the adjacent hypotenuse. I will comment here that I seem to have some extra parentheses. Uh, these parentheses just tell R that it should go ahead and print out the results of the statement that are within those parentheses. So in this case, it just prints out adjacent, right? It turns out to be 1.732. Uh, and if I had typed in adjacent, it would give me that same value. So this just makes code a little bit uh, more succinct uh, and so you might see that on occasion with somebody else's uh, code. Okay, so that's what I want to introduce today. Uh, stick around for a second and I will show you um, how I've actually used this to help me construct a climbing wall. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, if you have any comments about what content I should try to cover in this series about how to learn to use R, I'd really appreciate if you commented down below. All right, so now I did use R uh, when I was trying to build a climbing wall. And the climbing wall I was trying to build was in my garage. I had a, uh, well, I was working with eight foot or four by eight sheets of plywood. Uh, I didn't really want to have to cut those sheets of plywood. And so I wanted to, um, as much as possible, use that whole sheet. But I was interested in having the climbing wall be overhung. So that is, it's sort of slanting back on yourself as you're trying to climb on that wall. And, and so I needed to do some calculations to figure out um, how high up I needed to put the studs to support that pl piece of plywood, how high up the wall to start it so that it had the correct angle that I was looking for. After a little bit of internet research, I found that uh, good angles for climbing walls range from about 30 to 45, although some say even like 20 to 45. Uh, as this was a relatively new endeavor for me and my family, I thought we should err on the uh, not as overhung, so it's more of a vertical wall rather than a more overhung wall. And so I was suggesting that well, maybe we work with an angle of 30 degrees, okay? And so then the question was, okay, if I want the angle to be 30 degrees, then how high up the wall do I need to start uh, the supports for that piece of plywood? So I know that piece of plywood that I'm gonna put up there is going to be eight feet in length, and so I need to know what the height of that plywood is going to be relative to the ceiling in the garage so that I know where to start those support beams on the bottom. Okay. And so here uh, I wanted an angle of 30 degrees. And so I'm going to change that into radians. I know the hypotenuse is going to be that eight feet on the wall. Uh, and so I need to then calculate the adjacent side in order to know how um, really how far down from the ceiling I needed to start the supports. And so I can calculate that using our standard formula of adjacent over hypotenuse is the cosine of the angle. And it turns out that the uh, distance from the ceiling where I needed to start this was 6.92 feet. Now, of course, it's not very convenient, right, to have decimal places when working in feet because normally our rulers uh, or our measuring tape have feet and inches. And so I'm gonna go ahead and calculate the feet that just rounds down this adjacent value, which in R is the function floor. And then I'm going to go ahead and calculate the inches that are left over. So we take the total length that we had, we subtract those that are in feet, and then we multiply by 12 to get in inches. And so we have 11.1 or about 11 inches. So now I know from the ceiling down to where I need to start this board, I need to come down six feet, 11 inches, okay? Now, then I decided though, I didn't want 30 degrees. I decided let's go for it all. Let's go 45 degrees, right? And I can very quickly adjust my code here. Uh, and now I need to be five feet, eight inches approximately from that ceiling. Okay, so this is a video about how to use R as a calculator. It's just trying to get you over the uh, hump of apprehension when starting a new piece of software or programming language. Hope you enjoyed. I uh, will catch you later.